Three, two. Welcome back, WNST Towson, Baltimore, and WNST.net. We're doing Baltimore positive. We're back at State Fair, which means Benedicts and meat and all sorts of stuff for Don Muller over here. Your chicken and waffles. <laughs> You know, all I would want to ask for you at State Fair is that you could walk home from here. You could walk it off. <laughs> and on the 4th of July, when the parade's coming through here, right? <laughs> well, remember, last week we had to apologize because you cheated on State Fair and you had chicken and waffles at one of our other great sponsors at Fadley. So, you know, you, you're not a monogamous guy when so it comes to So you go to Fadley's <laughs> and they just put food in front of you and I'm expected to eat it at 8 a.m. And I did, and I'll do it again next week with Mayor Jack Young. But I'll tell you what. You set today. You, by the way, Don Moeller is the best executive producer in all <laughs> of Baltimore radio. All of our guests are because Don is working hard to make these things happen. Uh, except that Larry Hogan comes in. I'll take credit for that. Um, today's guest well, wait, is wait, very you get near to today's dear. guest. This you're going up the street to Jennings as well, We're right? You're going to have a hamburger up at Jennings. I, yeah, absolutely. We've signed cake. Jennings to be our sponsor. We'll be there in a couple of weeks. I'll probably be there after the second margarita on 4th of July. You know what that says, Nestor? It says that a lot of businesses, and it's great. Growing by the week. A lot of businesses are going to join us in this journey. They believe, they see the connection to Baltimore and the region and the state. And they know we're not going to build walls and they want to be part of it. So, Fadley, State Fair, Jennings, all the others that are coming on, thank you. So now, so who, we are brought today? today a true enemy of the people. One of my fellow enemies of the people <laughs> and journalists. C. Fraser Smith is there. You know, I used to w watch you walk through the fifth floor on Calvert Street in the late 80s, early 90s, and I was always very intimidated by anyone that was a little older, or a little more Hopkins-y looking. I was a Dundalk kid at this point, right? <laughs> so like Alvarez and Simon and those guys, I was good with them. Etlin liked me a lot, still my Facebook friend. Bob Nuscart is responsible for me. I drink with him occasionally. But, like, you were working on lefty and bias. I'll never forget where I was the morning. I was in the newsroom that morning with Larry Harris uh, going to second edition, and Len Bias is dead. And, you know, I'm 18 years old, rolling my sleeves up in the summer of 86. And I guess that's where the story would pick up for me, for you, was you rolled your sleeves up. And, and wrote a book that everybody read. Everybody I knew read it, you know? You know, I thought uh, somebody had made a horrendous mistake that morning, and I, probably a lot of other people thought the same thing. I thought they must, be, must have been talking about his father. We had I mean, a thing you know, on the wire that was called Urgent. Do you remember that? Urgent was gr in the green type yeah. in our newsroom, <laughs> and when something came on the Urgent, that was the wire, that was the hotline, and that was for earthquakes, right, assassinations, that was for that sort of stuff. And that morning the Urgent thing came, and it had like typos in it, and it, was, it, it looked a little crayony because it was su such an urgent, crazy morning. Well, when we get... To talking later in the show about Frazier's book. We're going to talk about Urgent because it comes up again. It's interesting that you mentioned that. But let's let's jump back and Frazier, it's, it, you know, again, much decorated, several Pulitzer Prize nominations. I mean, historic career at The Sun, wonderful career at WYPR. Full disclosure, Frazier asked me a few tough questions along the way <laughs> in my public journey. I, I hope so. Oh, I hope so. He hopes so, right? Oh, and this is going to be spicy. Well, well, yeah, you <laughs> hope so. Boy, that, that says a lot. And we're gonna, we, we, there's no way we can do well, this. Well, you were doing a, your job, and I was doing and you, my job. And, and you know, Fra we're going to come back to bias, but one of the things we always say about this show, it's never a straight line. I always say in terms of journalism, people – we're always surprised. If you remember a few years back, it was during the Smith administration. There was a new paper in Baltimore, was supposed to be a little right, right leaning, the Baltimore Examiner. It was supposed to challenge the sun. Didn't last very long, <laughs> but they were pretty tough during that time, particularly on uh, Democrats, at least from our perspective, and, and were pretty hard on Jim Smith. And the day that the paper closed, uh, someone from the sun called and said, We'd like to get a comment from the county executive. I guess it's a happy day for him that the examiner's no longer around. I said, well, I'm pretty sure I know what the county executive's going to say, but let me go down the hall and I'll ask him and I'll, I'll get a direct quote from him. And, of course, Jim Smith said what we would expect Jim Smith to say or people who used to live by a certain set of values that we question in this day and age. Jim Smith said, no, it's not a happy day. It's never a happy day when a paper closes its doors. Just as you said, they're there to do their job. It's their job to hold all of us in public office accountable. And we just don't see that very much anymore. 
Well, you want if you're running against somebody, you want you want that person to be held accountable as well as you know you're going to be. And if you see something else happening with your opponent, that's not a happy day for you. No, no, not at all. So let's jump back because Nestor, you, you described it. Frazier described it. I was an assistant principal at Dundalk High School. Very similar reaction to yours, Frazier. I'm in my office. Somebody comes in and says, "Len Bias died." And I look, and I didn't believe it. You didn't believe it, Fred. So walk us through then your journey with the Len Bias story. Let us be the listeners. You tell us about your journey. Because we're How coming you up on it. I mean, right. uh, uh, June nineteenth, nineteen eighty-six. I mean, right. you, uh, you remember that day. You always remember that day. So walk us through how you got involved in this story and where it took you. Well, I got involved because I was writing a profile for a magazine in in Washington of uh, John John Slaughter, who was the chancellor, the chancellor of the, the university. Time. And he ended up really being in the, uh, I started, started to use this image, but the crosshairs of the media. I mean, the media was on his campus for months after this happened. And he was somebody that was a big supporter of basketball. And as that story uh, went along, uh, many, many unhappy things were discovered about the, the plight of athletes uh, in College Park. So I, I just, I just sort of stepped beyond that to do the book. I mean, I thought, you know, there's, there's definitely a book here. You, you, uh, you see, almost every element of society gets is uh, is being challenged. I mean, the 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 the, the so-called student athletes were on campus 40 percent of the time. How many of us could? prosper under those circumstances. Is that because they were traveling to they games? They were traveling during the, during, the, uh, during the basketball season. They were not on campus. So, uh, and they, you know, the, their cycle was to uh, essentially fail in the spring, get a little bit better in the summer school, and, and uh, get eligible again in the fall. And it, it just n never came close to being anything like student athletes. But it's a big problem. It continues today. It's, it it's 33 years away. later. I don't think we've come close to solving much of this, right? I mean, if anything, it's been exacerbated by how much money the coaches are making and how they keep their jobs and the shoe companies. And I, I do think it's amazing every year when it rolls out of March Madness how much money is involved right. in the sport and how the people playing don't get it. And in 1986, same case, right? I mean, it was... Oh, it was exactly the same case. Uh, and, and since then, it's been the same case at UNC, where I went to school, at Penn State, at Ohio State, everywhere. It's, uh, it, it just doesn't get any so better. So it didn't matter whether it was Dean Smith, Jimmy Valvano. It, just, it was Tommy Izzo. It's all the same. Can, can I, were you a sports fan? I mean, I, Totally. It, Okay, all right. So, so I it, thought I was an athlete. <laughs> well, I, you know? he's a heck so of a golfer. But, but this ahead. was a natural thing for you to write about at that point. It was the biggest story going. I mean, we were all Maryland people at that point. So you didn't really want to write a sports book. You, but you edged that way because it was well, bigger the, than sports. My assignment for the magazine was to do uh, something about somebody that was uh, in, the, in the most difficult uh, moments of his life. I mean, here you had a black chancellor in the middle of uh, of a crisis involving uh, players that sometimes were referred to as, uh, you know, they were they were on a plantation. They were they were they were working for the uh, boosters, and you know, and the, and you had an educator. You had a really a smart guy, a really caring, decent human being who was just uh, cornered by us and and by and by the world by. By people who somehow, uh, you know, the was, people broke every every possible way about Lefty. People loved Lefty, you know, and he was kind of a, a lovable guy. He really was. I mean, you know, the he, old he ball coach. Well, I know you <laughs> know. <laughs> hell, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I can go buy a coach. I can coach. 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 I'm gonna be the UCLA of the East boys. And he would come in the, to your house and and. Uh, convince your mother and father that you were going to get a hell of an education you were going to and it was going to be fun because you know the, the, the he was going to be the ucla of the east that's it i remember that quote and well all john of a sudden lucas he, tom mcmillan but he's also sullied as being crooked in some way or you know i mean valvano dies a legend and all that but i mean the shackleford and the chucky brown i mean the the, the recruiting part of all of that was really greasy right i mean dean smith managed to avoid that and stuff but but 
35 years later, Patino and all of the things that have happened that began there, Drizel was the first guy perceived as greasy because one of his kids died in a cocaine-fueled right. thing. That, that's sort of the end of your credibility, even if your credibility is good. And even if you are a good guy and you didn't do anything wrong or even perceived as wrong, but the cover-up then became part of, you know, like the story right well, that's that's the question frazier when you you dug into it because there is a lot of affection out there for lefty obviously finally getting into the hall of fame but on that by the way that speech if you haven't what, you, you seen ahead. lefty give the speech i have not it's one of the greatest things wow. go watch lefty give his speech all right if you're listening go watch lefty give no it's that. one of his no, greatest I, speech. I, it's it's phenomenal his hall of fame speech? his hall of fame speech was a year year and a half ago show stopping all right well yeah well then everybody out there go listen to it we're trying to focus on leadership. So one of the themes of our talking with you today, in addition to talking about your outstanding new book, The Daily Miracle, which I'm sure Nestor will devour coming from the world of journalism. But in addition to that, we're talking about leadership. So what did you, what did you learn from both watching Lefty and Chancellor Slaughter at that time try to navigate this crisis? What, what conclusions did you draw in the book? Well, it's hard to be a good guy. You know, Slaughter knew uh, and said and was quoted uh, at least a year before all this happened that the basketball program was like being on the, on the back of a tiger. He just knew that there were aspects of it that were, uh, da were dangerous and were not really honest. And yet, at the same time, he, he was famous for uh, sitting under the basket on the, on the Maryland end of the court I mean, he was uh, he was really into it. He 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 really loved it, and but he also wanted it to be as as good as it could be. It could be. And he, and he knew that it was a it was a daily project, and you just never knew what was going to happen. And so, I, I think I I admired Slaughter a lot, and I think he was under in, in, uh, immeasurable pressure. But I think he he. Uh, he tried to do what was the right thing, and he handled the the pressure pretty well. He wasn't happy with it, but uh, he saw it for for what it was. He he, I think he believed that there was a racial aspect to it, and he he thought that the you know the, that that the players were sort of were were victims. But they were also great beneficiaries, and, and there was something that they needed to be taken advantage of that they weren't. I mean, one of the things that, uh, and, and you know, you couldn't almost expect them to. A lot of those, a lot of those kids were brought into a university on very flimsy uh, academic credentials. Uh, you know, and, and people would say, well, they're not going to do anything other than play ball. But that's the way we beat North Carolina and Duke, right? That's the only way we can beat them. We have to beat them. That's the way we win. And if we win, we make money. And at the heart of it, now it's about money. And then I'm sure it was about money too. But that's the only way to win. Everybody else is cheating. We have to cheat too. That's well, there's a great a Gary Williams story. The, the boosters were unhappy with, with the uh, administration that came in after Slaughter was gone because they were trying to stand by their standards. And there, there were a couple of kids that, that they couldn't get admitted. And, and, they, and they cried and they made noise and they, and they uh, uh, went to the chancellor and said, uh, uh, Gary's recruiting with his hands tied behind his back and so you need to do something about it. So there was a meeting in, uh, 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 Kerwin was then the, the uh, president, meeting in his office with some of the boosters with with Gary Williams and and uh, they were there to talk about these two kids and they had their all their scholastic high school records uh, to show everybody there's right? like blue tarski <laughs> 0. 0. <laughs> they had all the, they had the data and and uh, the even the boosters are reading this and they're kind of looking up and saying these kids can't read <laughs> right. i mean they can shoot. They can shoot. They can shoot, Gary. He's, but they can't read. It's twenty read, points right. and ten rebounds. Right. <laughs> twenty. Come on. That which well, is a I criminal mean, story in itself about well, the fact was, they can't read. But go ahead. I mean, so 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 the, the at the beginning of the meeting, at least, 
uh, uh, Gary and his supporters are saying, um, if you don't let these guys play for us, they're going to play for somebody else and beat our brains out. And that's exactly what, that's happened. what happened. Pat Kennedy right. will take him down to Florida State, right. or yeah, yeah, that's the way. It's well, there were legendary stories about kids getting it somehow waivers to Duke and Carolina that had gotten turned down from from Maryland. And a lot of it, as you said, was in the wake of of the bias tragedy. How, how did slaughter come out on the other end, from your perspective? Because I'm always interested how leaders come out on the other end. Uh, well, Slaughter was an engineer, which was re really interesting. There were, weren't very many black engineers in those days, but his, uh, and you know, he he talked about as a as a young man, he had to almost overcome the the feelings and beliefs and and concerns of his parents because he wanted to be an engineer. He started out being a ham radio operator, and uh, <laughs> you know he, he as opposed he, to a ham on the radio. And he, <laughs> yeah, he said that. <laughs> But he thought he somehow or another he had gotten into his head that he could do this kind of work and 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 he ended up being able to do it. Well, at at uh, he, he ended up um, Reagan wanted got him to come to Washington to be head of the one big the, one of the big science uh, uh, um, organizations agencies, and then he got recruited by Peter O'Malley of Prince George's County. Because they, you know, there they were in the middle of a, of a uh, majority black county, I think, almost already by then. And a, a lot of their students were black. And they didn't have, you know, they, were, they, they didn't have much black representation. And so they, you know, they really wanted him. This is a quality guy, so let's get him. And it, and it worked really well as long as it worked. Right? And then, and then so he gets through all of it. He... It, the the committee that he put together, uh, as I recall, I haven't looked at this in a long time, recommended that that that, that Lefty go, and he did. Right. And then and then uh, he hired he hired uh, uh, Bob Wade right. from Baltimore to come down and be the coach, and it didn't work out very well. But by the time they got through all of that. Well, what was Slaughter saying then? Oh, you don't, you're not thinking, you don't think I'm moving quickly enough. I'm going to move quickly and drove up to Baltimore and hired Wade, which everybody thought was going to be a disaster, and it wasn't good. So yeah. Because it's hard to make that leap from high school to the NCAA with all the rules and regulations. It's just a different world. Totally, di totally different. Well, so Slaughter had an opportunity to go to uh, uh, not, it was a, it was a very good private, college in california so he went there and i'm sure he did well I, I i i haven't really kept up with him i actually drove flew out there once and interviewed him there <laughs> i interviewed him a lot in in college park i actually always felt that he wasn't ever really coming totally clean with me i don't think he was lying to me he just wasn't telling me a a lot about what actually happened. Well, the lawyers probably, <laughs> certainly the lawyers right. dictated. That, I mean, we're coming up on on a year now with the young man uh, from our area who right. passed away. On the, so you you say, what's the long tail in the leadership, Don? And and maybe uh, we've already answered that question, right? So this is all 1986, 87, 88. Bob Wade, and we're talking about Gary Williams and Kerwin years later, and we're still having meetings about having unqualified right. kids who can't read and letting them into the school because they can dribble and that's just look i've been doing sports radio for 30 years there's not one person in the audience that doesn't expect that want that in some way that's what they want the terps to be they you know cheat do whatever you need we want just want you to win and if you win we're okay with that and i mean patriots fans have been fine with you know it's uh, this is really <laughs> republicans have been fine with this uh quite frankly which could bring the thing full circle you know i wrote a couple things down and and i I, maybe this is for the next segment, but I think of you as such a journalist, and you say that Slaughter let me in and he told me some things, but not too much. And Don, you said when Fraser called or when the exam, when somebody calls and you're in government, and you're the PR guy. I said there's a 60 minutes call when you when you call and say I'm knocking on your door. You're not doing a fluff piece. I mean, you know, it kind of. And, and I have that issue after 30 years. Sometimes I knock on a door, and they think I'm there to promote them. Because I am. I'm here promoting State Fair, and I'm promoting an Eggs Benedict. I'm promoting Baltimore. I'm promoting your county. I'm promoting your book. Sometimes they want me to exploit them, which is they want me to advertise for them <laughs> without paying me, right? And then sometimes they think I'm there to expose them. They want you them. to be their friend. 
Okay, but then they think I'm there so to expose them. So you have to give them, them the speech. Right. Well, I, and, and of course, a, it, often you speech. are talking. Well, often you are talking to somebody that you're that you know well, right? And uh, so, you, so the speech the speech is pretty pretty brief. I, I, you know, I, yeah, we know each other, but I'm a reporter. And that's, it's a different thing than being your friend. I hope that I'll be your friend down the road. Right. But, you know, I, I, need to, I need to have you speak to me. I need to tell, you, tell me what's going on here. And it never, you know, my experience, and, and, and again, Frazier and I did interact a lot over the years. You know, interacted with a lot of the media. And you, you mentioned friends. I mean, I'll consider, by, by most accounts, folks would point to a, a Jane Miller as the toughest investigative reporter in town. And I consider Jane a friend. I mean, I, I would hope she would consider me a friend. But I never had any delusions at the fact that Jane and I were friends, that she wouldn't be coming after me or county government or anything. Well, let's just say you got a, a DUI one job. night. Yeah, you got a DUI one night. It's not her job to hide that you had a DUI. Right. It's her right. job to call you and say what happened, right? I mean, literally, the, the, the exposed part is interesting because as I meet these young athletes today, and you wonder why I'm talking to people who actually want to talk to me, right, is that there is a point where... Everyone now is coached up in government, in leadership, in every business that if anything goes wrong, you know, someone trips on the floor here, there's a, because of the legal eagles, everyone's afraid to say anything to anyone, and they think that this is the way you get exposed. And I'm, I'm shocked 30 years into this how easy it is, and I was a reporter forever, and I knew you as a kid and was trained by people like you, how easy it is to just look and lie and expect me and the, Don and I always get sideways on Angelos. Angelos expected me to take whatever he said and make it the truth. And somewhere between you saying it and me reporting it comes the filter of, is that BS? Are you telling me the truth? What, what's the foundation of the principles? Does this make sense? Why? Give me the why again. And it always goes back to who, what, where, why, when. You know, all the things, that, the basic tenets that were there. And if I don't believe it, I can't put my name on the byline above it. I can put your name in quotes around it, but I can't, I can't take that as my fact when I don't believe it. And I've got five credible, I've got five Don Molers and Frazier's over here saying, this is, this is what we saw. And I've got Don out on the golf course saying, no, it was a hole in one, well, even well, though somebody kicked it well, in. You here, know? Here, here's yeah. the thing. It's, it's just making sure that everybody understands what the ground rules are. Is the truth the ground rule, though? If I'm, if I'm, well, let's, let's just, let me just Walk through the ground. Okay, yeah. go ahead. I'm I mean, sorry. If, if I'm dealing with Don, he, he knows what the ground rules are, and he, if he doesn't want to talk to me, he's going to say, uh, I, I can't talk about that, um, or I'll tell you off the record, and I'll say, I don't want it off the record because I'm going to find out what's going on from somebody else if you don't tell me. Uh, if you want to talk to me for background... I understand what that means, and so do you. Uh, you may want to do that because you, you want me to understand right. what's going <clears throat> on. And, and if we don't have that relationship, we probably are going to have some trouble. The problem is mostly with people that are not familiar with all of that. And, and if you don't, I mean, well, I always tried to explain it to people. If I was talking to somebody that I knew had not been in front of a reporter before, so that I don't want to take advantage of somebody. I mean, you know, I, I think in the beginning, it's, a, it, it's, it's too easy to do in the beginning of your career because you want the story. You want to hear them. Then after a while, you think you really need to, to have a, a very uh, arms, not arm's length, but face-to-face -face relationship with somebody that, that's helping you. The truth uh, I mean, sometimes you, you somebody, Seymour Hersh described uh, uh, objective reporting in the U.S. I mean, he was more, uh, I think, he thought more, uh, more favorably about the, the way the Europeans do it. But he said objective reporting is when you get somebody to tell you a lie to balance the truth. You know, there's, a, there's an instinctive thing to want to write a balanced story. But sometimes there isn't any right. balance. And that's your point. Sometimes so you there don't isn't want to invent balance. the balance if it's not really if it's if it isn't there. So uh, I mean that that was always the way I well, tried well, to proceed. The key word I think there, Fraser, as you said, is truth. It's interesting as we peel this onion back, and I hope for folks out there 
with two journalists sitting here getting an insight as to how the, the business works. And, and I know we're coming up on a break. So much to talk about. We will get to Frazier's great new book, The Daily Miracle. But I just had an interaction. It's funny what you said about the ground rules. Just had an inter interaction yesterday with a reporter, a fairly lengthy interaction about an issue. And I've done this a number of times over the years, probably did it with you. I sometimes, if it's a complicated issue, that's more than a one or two sentence answer. I will often say, here's what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you. I'd like to talk off the record. Take all the notes you want. My guess is, at the end, we're going to come back, and everything I've said off the record, I'm going to say, yeah, it's fine. But that way, I don't have to parse my words so that I don't say something that sounds silly or m misrepresents Now, what happens issue. when the journalist doesn't respect that? They, and, I've never had to, I would say that this is why I get so angry at the president. So angry at the president. I've never, I guess it can happen. Nestor, I've never had a journalist. Well, we have dirty I've cops. I've never had we a have journalist dirty, you know, betray like, that. Yeah. I've never had him betray off the record, background, deep background. I've never had one. Because they want to call you back next week. Because And they, they also know you're a trained professional. Well, That's different than me talking to an athlete or even me talking to a football coach who's not really a trained professional. But, He's got a trained professional next to him trying to mince and parse every word. And, 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 and Frazier, I'll tell you, I tell Don this all the time, if this Baltimore Positive is going to be a PR effort, we might as well bag in it because no one will listen to it. You know, Don, uh, Art Modell said to me when he you know, stole the team off the Baltimore, the first time I ever sat with Art Modell, he said to me, young man, you report what's fair and what you think. Because if all you ever right. do is praise me, they'll never believe a word you say. And, and you know, and good for him. Uh, and, good and that's, for him. I'll never forget Art saying that to me. And he saw it that way because he was 65 years old at the time. He'd been kicked around like a pinata. He'd sat in league meetings. He watched the league go from something he bought with $4 million of debt to something that we had $300 million. You know, so I think part of that comes with, look. I met you when I was 17 years old getting my permission slip signed by the Baltimore Washington Newspaper Guild to get into the Baltimore Sun. You know, you... You're, you've always been older than me. Don's been a mentor to me. I met him in 1982. Uh, Frazier and I are right? older than almost everybody. But the conversation yeah, we we're now having <laughs> would have been a different conversation, I think, dramatically 30 years yeah. ago, just based on our experience in walking the world when you were a high school principal as opposed to a 20-year trained public communicator, you know, all, all of those things that you learn about on the record and off the record. The, the, what I've learned in the modern era is people out on Facebook that are seeing Russian-led propaganda during a political, they don't know truth. They don't know these rules. They didn't go to they They really have a, a, a difficult time disseminating what's in the National Enquirer and what they're seeing on nightly news from what, like, is really happening in the world. And that's very Orwellian. Can we take a break and, uh, and pick it up on perfect, that? Perfect spot to take a break. So much to talk about. We've got to talk. We're here the day after the President of the United States tells everybody it's okay for foreign entities to become involved in our elections. we got Frazier's great new book, The Daily Miracle. What That's going to take you I'm, inside journalism. You're going to love it. Can we it. just do that in the next segment? Next segment, The Daily right. Miracle. So much to talk about. We're here at State Fair. Frank Zappa. Yeah, we're going to change. We're going to switch gonna get it Aretha, <laughs> Aretha, Paul McCartney, Freddie Mercury, Stevie Wonder. I want to get Mick and I want to get Mick and David behind. There me. you go. We'll be dancing in the streets. So we got we got so many great sponsors: Fadeleys, Jennings, State Fair. Everybody's getting on this Baltimore positive train. So what do we say, Nestor, as we come back? All right, we're going to come back. We're going to talk to uh, Fraser Smith about uh, his book. We're also going to talk about Governor Schaefer in the next. We have to go overtime. Uh, way overtime. Evan, today. we need caffeine over here. <laughs> we are WNST.net, AM 1570, WNST Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We're in Catonsville. Stick with us.